This week, we would like to talk about the so-called affordable, so-called clean energy rule and why Gina McCarthy is pulling out her bell-bottom pants. Hello, and welcome to Outrage and Optimism, a new podcast about dealing with the climate crisis and remaking the world. I'm Tom Ravikarnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. And today, we discuss the repeal of the Clean Power Plan announced last week by the Trump EPA. We talk about what happened, what it means, and why its significance goes well beyond climate change. Plus, we talk to Gina McCarthy, former administrator of the EPA under President Obama and current professor of public health at Harvard University. Thanks for being here. So this week we're in the US and just a few days ago, the Clean Power Plan, which was Barack Obama's signature policy to address greenhouse gas emissions from power plants, was replaced by the EPA with what is called the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, and they could hardly be more different. Now, we should say at the top end that due to an endangerment finding which established that greenhouse gases are pollutants, the EPA is required to do something about them. But what is entirely evident here is that the Trump administration is claiming to put in place a rule, but in fact doing nothing at all. It has claimed it has no authority to do anything other than a few small fixes to technology, and as a result has produced a rule which may actually increase emissions, but even by their own best case estimates would lead to a reduction of only 1.5% by 2030. Um, The EPA's own analysis shows that this could lead to more than 1,400 additional deaths per year and 48,000 new cases of asthma, not to mention the catastrophic impact in terms of increased greenhouse gas emissions and all the chaos that could flow from that. So this will, of course, be challenged in the courts and various attorneys general are gearing up to challenge it now. But that doesn't stop the impact that it will have. And it's deeply demoralising to see this signature piece of rulemaking rolled back. And later on, we'll talk to Gina McCarthy, the former administrator of the EPA and the woman who wrote many of those rules. But first of all, let's just start by discussing how industry is going to respond to this. Power utilities are private companies, although highly regulated, and this is presumably all aimed at helping utilities and coal mining. So do we think that they at least are going to welcome this rollback? Well, I think some may welcome it, uh, but I think th- those people will be looking really very, very short term. And actually, for the majority of uh, utilities planning long term capital expenditure, this is basically a disaster because it throws complete uncertainty into their capital expenditure planning. It increases the risks of stranded assets. It's short term gain for a few with an enormous cost for the many. I, I think it's terrible. So I think the one industry that uh, this is meant to favor, and hence the industry that will be most pleased, is the U.S. coal industry, an industry that, frankly, with or without climate change, it's actually an industry that is on its way out for the very simple reason that coal uh, electricity generation is simply no longer competitive. Uh, natural gas in the United States has put coal basically out of business. And uh, that's an interesting uh, phenomenon when one fossil fuel actually pulls puts the other one out of business. So the fact that the federal administration does something like this to artificially prolong the shelf life of an industry that is no longer competitive on any account it's no longer competitive on the financial way because it it generating even with established and amortized coal plants is already more expensive than with new renewables it is the highest polluting fossil fuel and hence is responsible for a great part of the air pollution that is killing citizens in the United States and abroad And there is growing social 
intolerance for coal plants in uh, in backyards and for the local particulates that coal produces. So it is really quite extraordinary to have a national rule that is very obviously targeted to um, buttress a dying, polluting, and obsolete technology. And it's even more amazing that it is called affordable, clean rule. <laughs> it is neither affordable nor clean. So, you know, if you if you take the narrative and it's a it's an interesting angle that you've brought up, you know, why why has he done this? And obviously it's politics, it's got nothing to do with with economics, because obviously the economics are pushing in a different direction. Um but if you if you unpick this at core, it's about, you know, this kind of narrative of the American worker and, you know, that Trump digs coal and all these other things. But if you look into the data, I mean, there's only about 50,000 people employed in coal mining in the US now. And, and that's partly to do with a decline in the amount of coals being used for combustion and largely to do with mechanization of mining. And since Trump took office, there's only been about 2,000 additional jobs added. So it, it's beginning to seem extremely strange that so much of his policy and of his kind of narrative is focused on reviving this industry that sort of employs statistically a, a number of people that is of almost no significance. Well, you know, if, if my memory does not betray me, during his campaign, when he was uh, very much saying that he wanted to bring coal as an industry and coal jobs back, I remember the coal industry in the United States discreetly but quite firmly informing him that there were no future jobs yeah. in coal, um, in, independently of climate change, basically because mining has been automated. And so it's very difficult to, even if you are going to open new mines, it's very difficult to put a reasonable amount or, or, or an important number of people there because all of that is automated. Um, and so it is just completely irresponsible to promise something that he knows, as he has been informed by the industry itself, that it is undeliverable. You cannot create more jobs in coal in the United States. Okay, but Christiana, you know, these things happen for a reason. There are people who own considerable coal assets, and I think it's their interests that are really being served here. But uh, Gina McCarthy herself said, you know, it's kind of saving some polluters money, even at the expense of our children's future. And just, I know some people, some of our listeners said that you, Christiana, gave Theresa May um, a, bit of, a bit of an easy ride last time. We all saluted her leadership, but look at the contrast. You know, the US has completely surrendered its leadership position on climate change. You've got the, the UK committing to, to, to net zero emissions by 2050. You've got the US essentially going backwards, you know, towards coal. It's, it, it's, it's tragic and, and it's, it's a real contrast. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I think just, to, I mean, on, on the jobs thing, I mean, you know, the Duke Energy came out when this happened last week and said... Um, that this wasn't going to change their plan to create a sort of long-term transition away from coal, wholly based on economics. So, I mean, to come back to what you just said then, Paul, I mean, it, I mean, this is basically a function of a captured government that is serving the interests of those who are paying to support elected representatives. I mean, it's a form of corruption, isn't it? Well, I think it is. But I mean, you've got to remember, government draws its authority from its ability to protect the citizen. And this kind of discrimination against children is completely unacceptable. And I, I think it's also quite short term. This is a sort of four to eight year, 10 year benefit for a few individuals and a huge loss for the nation and indeed the world. Sorry to sound so dramatic, but it's true. Well, a, a few years benefit. The other way of looking at that, Paul, is um, that it artificially... Uh, extends, uh, as I said, the, the lifetime of this industry. Hope, bottom line, know that uh, the sun is setting for them. Mm -hmm. But it also, sadly, removes the incentive for the other energy industries, the industries of the 21st yeah. century, 
to make the um, the investments in innovation and in market capture that they should be making as we look into the energy transformation and where we're going to be worldwide in five to 10 years. It's a little bit like, you know, throwing a tantrum and saying, I really, really, really want my landline. I want my landline and I'm going to keep my <laughs> landline when everyone else is on cell phones. I think it might actually be more like a Betamax or VHS tape. It's even further ago than landlines, but yeah. Um, so so what do we, I mean, you know, it's difficult, right? But but what do we do about this? I mean, in you know, this is obviously uh, a very depressing and disappointing outcome this is firmly in the outrage camp rather than the optimism and um and and with the democratic debates having happened you know just yesterday uh climate change wasn't a top issue and alexandria ocasio cortez actually came out and said it should have been more prominent but it was there and it was evident that everyone on the stage would do something about it or certainly do more than trump's doing um even if they wouldn't all make it a top priority although some would but but you know that's so we've got 18 months and there may be a different administration and they will take a different set of priorities but in the meantime is there anything people can do about this? How how should people channel their energy and their outrage in the immediate aftermath of this unbelievable act? I think this is very much of an air pollution issue. Yes, it's also right. a climate issue, but very, very directly, it is an air pollution issue. And uh, in, in, in the United States, there are plenty of adults, mothers to start with, um, mothers, isn't it called Mother's Clean Air Force? Mom's Clean Air Force, yeah. Yeah, Mom's Clean Air Force. Uh, we're really concerned uh, about the quality of air that their children are necessarily breathing because they can't stop breathing. Yeah. And it is really, um, it, it's just very sad. I was just, I, I shared with you that I was just in Paris uh, this morning and um, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, was inaugurating, together with Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York, they were inaugurating 150 air quality monitors that they're installing in schools in Paris because um, they're really concerned about air pollution in Paris. And they really are very, or Anne Hidalgo, as a, as a mayor, is very, very committed to cleaning the air pollution. Yes, in part because of climate change, but much more urgently and immediately because of the health of citizens. And apparently in the United States, we still have yet to see people on the streets, people out there in frank outrage, as you've said, Tom, to say this is completely unacceptable. This is breathing pollution, smog and soot directly into the lungs of U.S. citizens. Yeah. Okay, so um, that sounds like a good place for us to segue into a conversation with Gina McCarthy. Uh, Gina was the administrator uh, for President Obama in his second term. Uh, she was the deputy administrator for the first term, and then she stepped up and became the administrator for the second term. Um, and she was remarkable in terms of her ambition and her reach in rulemaking. She wrote the rules behind the Clean Power Plan. She was extremely active in both advocating for the, uh, the legal right of the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act and also taking steps to engage with stakeholders, to develop the rules, to sell it to the American public. And um, I mean, I can't imagine how she's feeling today having seen these rules roll back. But let's give her a call and let's find out. Well, Tom, I should say, you know, get ready to our listeners <laughs> because Gina is not one to mince words. Uh, <laughs> she really is very, very forthright in her opinions. So don't expect a shrinking violet. Do not expect a honed uh, diplomat here. You will really know what she thinks. Nice. Excellent. Let's do it. Gina, again, thank you very, very much for taking uh, taking the time. Uh, we we know that you have pretty transparent opinions about things, so don't feel that you have to have any uh, veiling uh, to use Tom's words about uh, about what we uh, we're going to talk about because we are, I think, correctly assuming that you might might be incensed. Uh, about what you're seeing uh, coming out of EPA after so much work of yours and your colleagues 
to put uh, together the clean power. Um, and and now we have something that is called uh, affordable clean rule. And we don't think it's either affordable or clean. But what were you expecting? Because I'm sure you have many colleagues still sitting at the EPA. Uh, I'm sure, you know, there's nothing secret anywhere, certainly not in Washington, D.C. So is this better, worse, or exactly what you thought was coming? Well, Christiana, first, let me tell you how terrific it is to spend time with you. I very much appreciate it in your continued dedication to these issues. Uh, you remain a, a tremendous leader and hero, so thank you for that. Well, listen, let, let me tell you, you, you asked me to be honest, and I'm going to do that in the most polite way I can. That would be very unusual for you, Gina. I know. I, as polite as I can get <laughs> is to say I'm just really, really ticked off. But, you know, it's not unexpected um, because this administration, since they came in, has done nothing but a, basically try to eviscerate the agency try to minimize its authority, try to question science, uh, especially the science around climate, which we both know is, is robust. And this, this rule is just like all the other rollbacks that they've written, which is based on, on facts that aren't true. They are not facts. And it's best based on assessment that's specifically designed, unlike all the cost-benefit assessments that the agency has been doing for decades, specifically designed to get to an outcome that this administration wants. So as much as it ticks me off, I am reading this knowing that it wasn't done in a way that followed the law. It wasn't done in a way that advanced the science in a way that the agency is responsible to do. Mm -hmm. And it won't you know, stand the test of time. Uh, but mm -hmm. having said that, it just continues to be distressful at a time when climate change science tells us that we need to move farther and faster than ever before, right. that this administration is just doing diddly squat while it wastes time talking about bringing back coal as if coal is our future. So well, I'm kind of ticked off to be as polite as possible. Yes. Um, Gina, you, you have actually said that the current leadership has ignored scientists, buried information on climate change, and rolled back regulations to favor industry, specifically the coal industry. Um, but you've been at this for many years. How, how does this compare the current ignoring of science for very specific purposes under this administration? How does it compare to other administrations, in fact, even other administrations under the same political party? How, how would you place this in the history of, of science and EPA in the U.S.? Well, Christiana, over the 37 years of, of my uh, career in public service, I worked uh, at the state level pri prior to working for President Obama. And at the state level, I worked for six governors. Five of them were Republicans, five of them. We passed actually plans that, that provided a wonderful opportunity to reduce um, carbon pollution in those states. We actually advanced the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative under a, I worked on that under a leadership of a Republican governor. And I will tell you unequivocally that while new governors come in, and in this case, new presidents come in, they have every right in the world to have a different policy view, to think differently. What they don't have is a right to come in and create the kind of uncertainty that this administration is creating, that even the industry sector, like the car auto manufacturing sector, like even the power plants are reeling from today. And they don't have a right to make up facts and not follow the process of law in how you do rulemaking and expect to get away with it. And so I am confident of one and only one thing that this rule won't stand the test of time. But what, it, what terrifies me is I cannot be confident 
right now that we haven't lost so much significant time that we will not be able to recoup back. And to have the United States fall from a leadership position where, Christiana, we tried to take really good action, which we did with the Clean Power Plan, that the rest of the world could actually see so you could spearhead with others the delivery of the Paris Agreement. And to see this administration so call callously disregard science and the law to their own benefit without thinking about what it means for our health and well-being in the future of our children is, is simply way more than disappointing. It's a disaster in and of itself. Um, but speak to me a little bit more about the legal implications. You've said they are disrespecting the law. What do you mean by, by that? Are you, are, are you saying that they are walking back what the EPA can legally do? Or are you speaking much more about the regulations themselves? And we know how car industry reacted just a little while ago to, uh, to the Trump attempt to roll back uh, vehicle standards. Are you speaking about the regulations themselves or are you speaking about the legal standing of EPA? No, I'm, I'm speaking about the actual rulemakings themselves. Let, let me, let, without getting too wonky about this, you know, let, let me give you a sense of what they did. The Clean Power Plan, as, as uh, President Obama and, and I and others designed it, was, was designed to be able to reduce uh, carbon emissions from, from the power sector uh, by 32% below 2005 levels by 2030. That meant we captured all of the great work that had been done by for, before by states and others to try to transform the market, and we demanded that the market almost actually more than double the emissions that were projected under business as usual, because those were only projected to be about 13 to 15 percent. We went to 32 percent, and we did it by applying the law in a way that made sense, because power sector or the energy world delivers in markets. It works in markets. No individual power plant stands alone. So we recognize that market shifts to renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency uh, work that states do, uh, e even continued use of nuclear power could all, all impact the amount of greenhouse gases that were emitted. And we should look at energy as a system, not an individual facility. But what this administration did was it said, and this is arbitrarily they decided to take the most narrow view of the law. And instead of looking at it to basically do the mission of the agency, which is to protect public health and, 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 and natural resources, they decided instead to only only look at a few technologies that could be done at individual facilities that could be invested in. They gave states the authority to figure out how much should be done and told them, in essence, you can think of a whole lot of things and decide in the end that they don't even have to do anything. But they estimated that they would get 35 percent reduction. And as a result of this rule, when essentially this rule offers no reductions, even if you kind and looked at those few little technologies being rigorously implemented by the states, all they really counted was business as usual and another 0.7% reduction. So it, it is ludicrous to think that any anyone is going to look at this and actually take it at face value without laughing out loud. So, Jeannie, I mean, you said that they they did these or these things with these terrible impacts to human health and with these these narrowing years we have to do something on climate change. And a minute ago, you said something interesting. You said um, they've done this to their own benefit. And I just want to ask you about who benefits from this. I mean, the decline in the co of the coal industry in the U.S., as you know better than anyone, is a long-term trend driven by price. That This won't change that. There are now only 50,000 jobs left in coal mining in the U.S., and Trump, for all of his efforts, has only managed to add 2,000 uh, additional jobs since he came to office. So who benefits from this, and who are they? Why? I suppose the question is, why have they done this and for who? 
Well, it's certainly they haven't done it for the, for the benefit of, of our sh- American families and our kids, uh, that's for sure, because they need a more stable I- environment and they need a sustainable way of, of continuing to move forward both economically and in terms of our health and well-being. So, you know, we all knew and it was very clear that when this administration came in, you know, I think the president himself indicated that he was really working for his base. And that's what he's doing. And a lot of the the fossil fuel companies and the coal companies uh, were his major contributors. And he came in with a things to do list. And this was one of them. And it was put on there by one of the major coal um, uh, the, the major coal figures, the owners of a significant amount of, of coal. And, and that's, I guess, what they're doing it for. Um, what, for whatever reason they're doing it, you know, they are doing everything they can to, to not just uh, do rules that, that advance um, dirty coal and continued use of fossil fuels and maximize that as well as its extraction. Um, but they, they really... Um, I think they, they make put us, the United States, in a very difficult position uh, to continue to be a partner with other countries in what we know to be a worldwide problem that needs a worldwide answer. You know, Christiani, you know that, that I think when we were working together and when President Obama was in office, he spent a significant amount of what we call recovery money, money that was being spent to invest in our economy to recover from from the, uh, uh, the great damage that was done back in 2008. And he spent a lot of that money in clean energy. You know, part of the task of the federal government is not just to regulate, but to send market signals and invest in innovation. A lot of that paid off. And so we're basically shooting ourselves in the foot economically and in terms of job growth. Uh, by by neglecting to see climate change as an uh, action on climate change as an opportunity to actually grow and continue to grow jobs because we know solar and wind is is far far more successful in terms of job growth than than other sectors are it is the fastest growing and we also know that in order to be economically competitive and sustainable we have to start embracing this challenge more effectively or we're going to be left in the dust by the countries that do. I, I, for whatever reason he's doing it, I think it's just a, a serious mistake. And mm-hmm. it, it could, you know, be a, an existential mistake. Well, speaking about existential mistakes, among uh, among other things that you command, Gina, certainly uh, science and, and climate change, you're also an air quality expert. Um, t- talk to us about the air pollution implications of what they're doing. Yeah, uh, you know, I think people mistakenly think that this administration is only going after climate science when they're going after science itself. Uh, They are basically proposing um, uh, rules that would disallow them from looking at some of the best science available, because one of the best studies actually came out of the Harvard School of Public Health, which I'm part of now, and it's called Six Cities. And that study looked at particulate matter and its dangers, and it did a huge um, uh, longitudinal study. Uh, and, and this administration has decided that only if the raw data associated with a science study is available and can be manipulated and looked at by others, um, are we allow, is EPA allowed to even consider it in decision making? And this, if you did that to this rule, the six city study, then you would eliminate the best data the world has available on the dangers of particulate matter. And you would not be able to advance regulations. And in fact, you would end up rolling back regulations. This administration is is attacking air pollution while our president is standing up and saying we're the cleanest and the best. And, and what is what what are the facts on that? How how would you say the U.S. as a whole, and I know that's uh, quite a quite a large geography there, but how does the U.S. compare with other industrialized countries in terms of air pollution and uh, and diseases caused by it? Yeah, I, I only know of, of uh, one uh, way of rating that, and it, there is an international organization that looks at that, and, and EPA um, ranks overall 27th, um, and we are almost at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to comparison with other strong democracies. 
Now, I'm not proud of those numbers. Um, we're working hard. Um, but we have to acknowledge that we have a long way to go, and this administration is trying to both diminish science, take the best science off the table, because we won't release personalized health information, which we can't. And they're trying, they're basically taking our science advisory boards at EPA and filling it with industry scientists and telling scientists that have received any kind of grant from EPA that they're, they're somehow tainted and can't provide sound at the science that, that underpins our rulemaking. They're taking climate science off the web. They've taken it off uh, most of it. They've returned it with minimalistic um, uh, rigor. Um, they are so they just have a concerted intent to basically pigeonhole the science, put it to the side, so that whatever rulemaking they want to do that is all aligned with with allowing polluters to pollute more, that all of those can continue uh, without having to worry about this sticky little thing we call facts and science. And it's it's distressing, and I'm sure the great people at EPA are concerned uh, about this in ways that we cannot even fathom. Because the scientists, they're epidemiologists, they're, they're statisticians, they're biostatisticians, they're chemists. You know, they, they don't see science as being partisan any more than you or I do. And is this all really about propping up one industry, the coal industry? Is that it? Bottom line, that's it? No, I don't think it is, Christiana. I think I think some of the way that that EPA's uh, work has been directed is specifically a line for that first. But uh, the, in the United States, there, there has been sort of a long term um, effort by some, I think, to make the federal government um, look like the enemy of the people, as President Reagan used to say, um, way back in the '70s and '80s. Um, and, and that kind of attempt to make government seem inadequate um, has in some ways succeeded because we haven't been able to get the resources we need to do all the tasks that Congress gave us. But in many ways, it's all really designed to diminish federal authority and to shift uh, federal authority to the states. And while the federal government, at least EPA, works closely hand in hand with states, there is absolutely no way that states on their own can have the expertise to manage issues like environmental pollution, particularly air pollution uh, that knows no boundaries. So this is more than just a small issue. This is an issue that has been funded for a long time to try to diminish not just the authority, but the size and the significance of the federal government in the United States. Gina, this is really fascinating. Thank you so much. I, I think we, we only have time for about one one more question. And, and what, what I would be really interested to know, um, you know, a, a lot of people I know in the US have had this obviously rising sense of despair as these rules have been rolled back. And, and this one has been a big one, right? And and I think people are feeling um, really, really quite despairing about the situation. I'm just wondering, I mean, you see this in, in such close resolution. You know exactly what they're doing. You really witness the unpicking that's going on. Um, how do you keep a sense of kind of momentum of what we need to do? And what would you say to people that kind of feel kind of despaired, they want to do something, but they don't quite know how to engage to try and make it better? Well, you know, I, 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 we've talked so much about the catastrophe side of the equation. I, I'm glad we're getting to the optimistic side. I tell them to turn off their television set. <laughs> I tell them to turn off their computers and go into their communities. I tell people across the United States to look at what hundreds of mayors are doing, what numerous governors are doing, and how they're advancing clean energy all over the place. That as soon as the federal government shuts down, the resilience in the United States means that every one of the rest of us has to sit up and take notice. And that is exactly what is happening. And you have to look at schools like Harvard where the students are engaged, they're excited, they want to do community level work. We're marching in the streets for crying out loud the first time since the 60s in the United States. So I'm breaking out my bell bottoms and my tie dyed shirts <laughs> and I'm hanging out with scientists and I'm going to go scream and yell. You know, and so you, you got to think about this. We had students at Parkland High that that actually had to live through an experience that for most of us would have been devastating. 
when mm. that shooting occurred. And what they did after that was to force a governor in Florida who never, ever anticipated having to sign a gun law to sign one. So if you think that just because the federal government or some curmudgeons don't want any change to happen or want us to think that America is going to be great if we go back to the 50s or the 60s, then you're dead wrong. That's not the United States. That's not how we live. So I may get ticked off. I never get hopeless. Hmm. Um, Gina, so now you're at Harvard. You are the director of the center of climate, health, and global environment. So you have under you first a fantastic set of professors, but also a perhaps even more fantastic set of students. What is, how do you communicate to them not only what they can and should be doing now, which you just shared for us, but also the vision of the future? What, what kind of a country are you preparing them for? What is the United States in your view beyond this administration? Let's take a longer view and a higher view. Uh, what is the United States going to look like on these issues on climate, health um, and environment and, and as a participant of global environment? What is it going to look like in the year 2040? Well, one of the things I'm trying to focus on, Christiana, is is um, not just to talk to the students, but I am a firm believer in grassroots efforts that need to be launched that actually generate momentum up so decision makers at all levels in this government have to sit up and take notice. And one of the things I'm trying to do is focus on health. You know, when you talk about what does the future look like, you know, I'm trying to explain to people that a, a, um, a, a, a zero carbon future, if we do this right, is healthier, it is more equitable, and it is more sustainable. If you look at it, I can't understand for the life of me why we're not, why we're not running to get electric vehicles and make them more inexpensive so we can drive them. They're better and cleaner than the kind of fossil fuel, oil-fired uh, cars that we've been using for decades. They'll keep our kids safe. They'll lower air pollution. They'll help us keep safer from both lungs and our cardiovascular system. Why aren't we loving electric vehicles, electric buses, and moving that, especially when it's always the most vulnerable that could hurt by challenges like air pollution? Why aren't we thinking of energy efficiency as something that benefits us, our solar, our renewable energy? If I don't have to pay an extra penny to a utility company, I'm dancing in the streets. So every <laughs> Everything we're talking about here is not a future of sacrifice. It's a future that can be healthier today by the actions we take on climate change and build us a future where there'll be less vulnerable populations, where people everywhere will be able to breathe clean air and have water and food that is safe and plentiful. This is what we need to think about, not sacrifice, not pain, not how much money is going to cost, how much huge amounts of money it is going to save us in human lives, how much huge amount of children will be healthier when they get up in the morning and feel good and grow to be an older age. In the United States, for the first time, we are living shorter lives than the generation before us. That cannot be tolerated. What we need to do is run to a zero carbon future, run, embrace it, say this is great and go for it. That's the future I tell them. Yay. If Love there it. ever was a conversation about outrage and optimism, this was it. Gina, thank you so much. Sorry, Tom, I interrupted you, but I just got so excited. Don't worry. <laughs> this is fantastic, Gina. Thank you so much for talking to us. This was wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your spirit and your energy. It's a big inspiration to us. Thanks so much. Thanks, thank Christiana. you, Gina. God bless. <laughs> So that was an amazing conversation with the remarkable Gina McCarthy. Christiana, where, where are you after that? Well, you know, as I said there at the end, I mean, it's so fantastic to have someone who speaks with such authority, with so much experience and with so much outrage about what she's seeing, but equally with such a deep felt optimism. 
um, about the fact that we are going to move toward a much better future and just an incredulity about the fact that, as she said, we're not running toward the future as opposed to crawling. Um, so I, I'm just delighted, you know, I'm, I just... I'm so confirmed in our sense that we need both the outrage and the optimism. No, totally. And I loved her advice, you know, young people, turn off the TV, get off your phone, get on the streets. You know, it was, I thought that was fantastic. I, th- I thought it was interesting also, you know, we pushed her on on the true motivations behind why Trump is doing this because the, the deeper you dig into it, the more weird it seems that so much political capital is spent on such a dying industry and she you know she stops short of calling it corruption but looking at this from an outside perspective it just looks like corruption right i mean so many people are going to be impacted by this it's going to have such a minimal effect on improving people's lives in terms of jobs and such a detrimental effect in terms of stopping the u.s economy from embracing the future the direct health impacts so yeah well but the other thing that she brought in that we have to remember is There is here in this sector in environment and the EPA, there does seem to be an intent to dismantle government um, and uh, and to weaken the authority of uh, of the public sector in so many different ways. That is very concerning because if you weaken institutions whose purpose it is to protect citizens currently and future, then you really uh, lose very much of the very necessary check and balance calibration that is in democratic systems. Um, And then you're, you know, completely moved over to very, very different forces that are much more short term, much more profit driven, not as intent on protecting the common good. It's very concerning. Yeah. Okay, well, I think this is one for outrage, if nothing else. So um, I think we should leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of Outrage and Optimism. So thanks for listening to this episode with Administrator Gina McCarthy. We've had a great few weeks on the podcast as we were featured on Apple Podcasts and climbed to number 10 in the charts. This is very exciting for us as we carry on learning how to do this podcast thing properly. We really like your feedback. The best way is to send us an email at podcast at globaloptimism.com through which you can reach any of us. If you have feedback on episodes, how we handled certain issues, ideas on other things we should cover, we love hearing from you. Um, I'm going to stop begging for ratings now because it's getting a little demeaning, but if you enjoy what we're doing and you want to help others to find it, you know what to do. So Outrage and Optimism is a production of Global Optimism. It is produced by Clay Carnell. The team includes Pete Clutton-Brock, Chloe Revel, Natasha Rivett-Karnak, Marina Mancilla, Alejandra vargas Morera, Callum Grieve, and Zoe Cholakantic. I'd also like to thank Nigel Topping and Michael Northrup. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and please do subscribe. Next week, we're talking about the EU, and whether and how they are going to succeed in stepping up climate ambition after the failed attempt to do so at the European Council meeting last week. We'll be talking with the Commissioner for Climate Action, Miguel Arias Cañete, an old friend and a key figure in the creation of the Paris Agreement. We'll see you then. Global Optimism.